How to make the ultimate virtual pinball part 7. In this installment, I'll continue work on the coin door so I can install an as good as new coin door in the cabinet. I'll also install several more feedback devices to truly have an amazing light show underneath the cabinet, as well as install individually addressable LEDs on top of the playfield. It's not all good things though. I'll also try to overcome the worst setback I've had in this entire build. Anyway, let's jump into it. With both doors disassembled, it's time to clean up the best parts. The biggest one is of course the faceplate. It's extremely dirty, but since it's stainless steel, this will clean up nicely. I start by removing most of the gunk with naphtha. I then move on to some sanding to really make it shine. As usual, I go through different grits and finish things off with steel wool. I also clean up all the nooks and crannies with a Dremel tool. To compare the before and after, I only sanded the right half. What a difference! I also clean up the other parts, starting with the backplate. This does not need to be pretty, as it sits on the inside of the cabinet anyway. After the backplate, I move on to the brackets that hold the sockets for the coin max. These aren't that dirty, so some naphtha does the trick here. Now the coin return chute. This one is quite dirty. I polished the entire thing using only steel wool, as it's a bit more gentle. This one cleaned up particularly well. Here's the before, and here's the after. Stunning if you ask me. After the return chute, I continue cleaning up the sockets for the coin max. I also use steel wool here to be a bit more gentle. Another great result with the old one on the left and the polished one on the right. I love where this is going. I continue cleaning up each and every metal part of the entire door, from the big hinges and chutes down to the smallest brackets and bolts. Now that all the metal parts are nice and shiny, I'll put a coat of varnish over them. Some of these parts have some kind of plating which sanding might remove, so just to be sure I want to give them some extra protection. I lay everything out on a plastic sheet so it can all be sprayed easily. I grab some clear varnish and start spraying all the parts, making sure to spray from different angles to try and get all the surfaces. Everything can now be left to dry. I love how beautiful everything looks laid out like this. Anyway, I grab all the pieces and head back inside. All the coiner parts are finally clean again. Now it's time to put this puzzle back together. I start by laying out all the parts again to get an overview. The back plate goes on first, then the plate above the coin return chute, all of the coin mech socket brackets, the coin return chute itself and the coin mech sockets. After that, the coin return lever is put back in place, followed by the two coin chutes. And finally, the coin chute bezel in the front. The bezel folds up nicely and is secured from the inside. Now it's time for the ultimate comparison. The best parts of two coin doors combined and fully restored against the worst parts. The difference is amazing. It almost looks like the restored coin door is new and fresh from the factory. All the front parts now look nice and shiny. Especially the badly damaged corner is now looking incredible. Not only the front looks great. I went ahead and made a new wiring harness to make the back of the coin door look like new as well. I wired up 12 volts for the electronic coin acceptors, as well as power for some LEDs behind the plastic price plates. I also wired up the old start button, it will act as a shift button for the cabinet. I also added a bank of 4 extra buttons, as real pinballs also have these for changing the ROM settings. I even wired up the slam tilt switch if I ever want to use it. I'm incredibly happy with the results after all this hard work. With the door now complete, let's finally install it in the cabinet. I put the door in place and install it with a couple of bolts through the large hinge. The new wiring harness conveniently plugs into two connectors inside the cabinet and now the coin door can be closed. It looks so good. I power on the cabinet and the lights behind the price plates neatly illuminate the plastics. I can now put a coin in a slot to see a credit gets added. How cool! Alright, up next the undercab lighting. This is just some regular RGB LED strip that I'll put underneath the cabinet. It will illuminate the floor in RGB colors and it will also respond to events in the pinball table. So if you hit the target for example, it will flash in a different color. To install the LEDs, I first need to drill a hole through the cabinet bottom so I can feed the wires through that will connect the LED strip. When all the wires are fed through, I can stick down the start of the LED strip and work my way to the first corner. I continue along the front in this uncomfortable position, crawling along the next side of the cabinet until I'm at the back. Once I've made my way around the entire cabinet, I can cut the end of the strip and stick it down. Connecting the LED strip is done by attaching a single wire to 12V. The ground for each color is connected to the pinscape. The entire bottom now glows in nice and bright colored light. It looks great from the top, with an even glow on the floor. Let's see what it looks like when playing a game. The LED strips light up in different colors, synchronized to the gameplay. It feels like a major extension to the flashers at the back of the playfield. 
Having installed the undercap lighting, I might as well expand it to the back of the cabinet and back box as well, as it's just some cheap LED strip. I first have to drill some more holes. I start with two holes in the back of the cabinet body, one on the left and one on the right. I also drill a single hole in the back of the back box. Just like the undercap lighting, I feed an LED strip with some wires through the hole and then stick down the strip. I do that once more for the other side of the cabinet body and finally one last time for the back box. On the back box, I make a U-shape along the top to nicely cover all the sides with LEDs. At the corners, I bend the strip in a special way in order not to damage them. To connect the LED strip in the back box, I crimp on another connector. When I have to take off the back box, I can easily unplug the LEDs. The other end of the wires are connected to another terminal block. Both sets of wires for the back of the cabinet and back box converge here, while the other side of the terminal block is connected to the pinscape. Once again, a really cool glow, this time from the back. Now, really, the entire room is illuminated. I love this effect. Next up, I designed and 3D printed two of these. These will hold the instruction cards. Just like on real machines, they'll explain how to play the game. In this case, though, it'll be how to select the game, start the game, and exit to the menu. To install these, I grab the apron and measure where to put the plastic holders so they sit nice and symmetrical. I mark their spot with some painter's tape and then glue down the plastics with CA glue, trying to align everything as best as I can. I then move on to the instruction cards themselves. I designed these myself and printed them on yellow paper, just like classic stern cards. For extra durability, I laminated them. I carefully cut out each card and slot them into the holders on the apron and install it in the cabinet for a really cool finishing touch. This is really another one of those small details that really makes the entire cabinet look professional. However, at this point, disaster struck. I have some bad news. Things are breaking in the cabinet and I don't really know what's happening. I think it started with a 48 volt power supply for the flippers and the slingshots. The first thing I noticed was that the MD screen stopped working. Next, the USB hub died and also a 2.1 channel amplifier that I installed for the subwoofer and the speakers. So to try and find the problem, I'm going to make a wiring diagram of this entire cabinet. I hope I can spot a problem and fix it. So let's draw this entire cabinet. I start by verifying all the connections by measuring the continuity with my multimeter. I then draw each connection I test in a diagram on my laptop. This really takes a lot of time, as there are a lot of devices and wires in the cabinet. Slowly but surely, I map out every single connection to every single device. In the end, I could not find a problem with my wiring, so I decided to follow my suspicion and throw out the cheap Chinese 48 volt power supply. I remove it from the cabinet and install a DIN rail in its place with two simple screws. As a replacement, I bought a power supply from a well-known brand that can definitely be trusted. I hook it into the DIN rail and connect the wires like before. Luckily, this ended up fixing all the issues. They say to never cheap out on a power supply and I should have listened. When working on all the 48 volt stuff, I did notice that the flippers are too loud for my taste compared to real pinballs. I tried several options to make them quieter and ended up with adding foam between the flipper assembly, cabinet and screws, as well as moving them underneath the playfield. Much better. At this point in time, I had another afterthought to add addressable LED strips to the sides of the playfield. Initially, I didn't plan on doing this, otherwise I would have routed some slots into the cabinet. I don't want to route out anything anymore, so I'll make another solution. I start by soldering a connector onto a 1 meter section of LED strip. I then grab an angled aluminum channel and lay down the strip so I know how long the channel needs to be. I cut off the axis with a metal saw and start sticking down the LED strip into the channel. These channels will also act as a heatsink for the LEDs. I click the tinted plastic into the channel which diffuses the light and start cutting some velcro tape. I stick some velcro onto the playfield and then onto the other sides as well, so I can lay down the aluminum channel and stick it to the velcro. I can then easily connect the LEDs with their connector. I do the same thing on the other side, first sticking down the velcro and then the metal profile. The LEDs will be controlled by a separate D1 Mini Pro, a cheap microcontroller that has precise timing, which is necessary for this kind of LEDs. I made a small PCB to easily plug in the D1 Mini as well as connect each LED strip. The microcontroller itself plugs into the PC, from which it will receive its commands. Now it's obviously time for testing. These strips can light up each LED individually, allowing for very neat effects like this when the ball sits idle in the shooter lane. They can also mimic the in-game flashers, lighting up in the same color and position. Some tables also have a chase effect when you launch the ball like this. These lights really add a lot to the light show of the cabinet. 
I love these addressable IDs so much that I'll also put them in the speakers. So I grab the speaker panel and remove the speaker grills from the acrylic front piece. I then remove both speaker drivers and flip over the panel to access the back. To feed the wires for the LEDs into the speaker holes, I cut out two tiny grooves into this raised section for the speaker drivers. I can then pop out the middle section to make a channel. After that, I can stick a small section of LED strip inside the speaker hole on both sides. The LEDs fit exactly in the hole and look really clean. I can then put the speaker drivers back in place and assemble the entire front again. The panel can then slot back into the back box to reveal the final result. I love how this looks. It really adds another extra feature to make the cabinet stand out. That's it for this video. The cabinet is almost completed now. The next video will be the final one. I'll install the final components and finally show some glamour shots and some actual gameplay. I'll also share my thoughts after two years of building and owning this virtual pinball machine. So you really don't want to miss that final episode. Make sure you're subscribed to get notified. If you liked the series so far, please show some support by liking, sharing or commenting on this video. I really appreciate it. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope to see you in the final one.